For fun, he takes photos and plays the piano. The rest of the time, he's known for his work in information technology and its application. He founded Wolfram Research, one of the world's most respected computer, web, and cloud software companies. He was placed at number 11 in the list of Britain's 50 new radicals. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Conrad Wolfram. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here in Bulgaria at, uh, at Webit. I want to talk about fixing education for the AI age. I think we have a major problem with particularly technical education around the world, and I wanted to explain to you what that is and how we fix it, and how countries and communities and organizations that really see how to do this can leapfrog others in everything that, uh, that comes from being well-educated technically. So the first thing I want to address is what effect does computers and AI have on education? There are really two categories of effects, and these often get mixed up. So the first one is that we need to learn subjects that have changed because the computer now does work for us that usually as a human we used to have to do. And I'll come much more onto that. Most of my talk will be about that. But the other thing we've got to, that people often think of computers as helping with is the pedagogy of learning. How do you learn a subject better? Can you replace teachers? Can you use computers to supplement that or to assess people better? And a lot of the focus of using computers around the world on education has been about that. Um, and so in a sense, AI drives the need for change, but it also provides those tools. So let me deal with that second one first. You know, there are many effects of AI on pedagogy, personalized learning, assessment, experience, you know, gaining more experience, how to adapt what you're learning to uh, the student. And kind of in involving students in following their own interests instead of just going down some mainstream thing that everybody has to learn. So there are many ways I think we can improve the pedagogy with AI. But for the rest of the talk, I really want to talk about how AI has affected the subject of education. And the key point to understand is we need humans to focus on what humans are good at and leave computers to focus on what they're good at. And you know, that involves also humans learning how to connect with computers in a meaningful way so that we have the best interface to get computers to do what we want. Question to ask, what are today's survival skills? You know, hundreds of years ago, they were how to make a fire or how to, you know, chip away, at, you know, kill an animal to eat, right? Mostly here, they're now a bit different. And I think we have some very modern survival skills to do with computational knowledge, thinking about how uh, we can compute things. You know, another thing to think about the other end is what, what are tomorrow's abstraction of knowledge? What's the currency? What's the value chain? What's at the top of the value chain of what a human can do? Now, hundreds of years ago, humans just physically built things or plowed the land. Now that's not the top of the value chain. So I think a core human skill of the future at the top of this value chain is what you might call computational thinking. Knowing how to think in a computational way about life. And at the moment, the big question is, around the world, we spend many, many hours of every ch child's life, every week, learning math. Is math doing computational thinking? Is it achieving this, or is it not? And my argument is, right now, it's the wrong subject. And we should use all those hours to do a much more computational thinking orientated subject. So let's dive into that a little bit and ask the question, why do we learn math? And indeed, why is math a subject that it's considered everyone in the world pretty much should learn for hours of their life? Well, I think there are three good reasons for the right kind of math. One is technical jobs that have so powered our economies and continue to do so. Another one is what we might call everyday thinking, everyday abilities to work in a modern society. You know, knowing how to deal with risk that's displayed to you, how to deal with your mortgage, these sorts of things, much more complicated than they were even 20 or 30 years ago. 
And the third one is what we might call logical thinking. Can you logically think about ways to approach life, whether with math or without math? Can you have a structure in your mind of how to do this? So that's kind of why I think math is an important subject for everyone to know, and it empowers societies, if it's the right math. Let's talk next about what math actually is. So I reckon math is a really a four-step process. You define a question, you translate that into this abstract notation, and the reason you do that is because you can then compute answers much better than you can by talking about it in, in a normal language, like English or, or Bulgarian or whatever. And then you interpret the results. You take that abstract answer and you go back and it, try and produce the actual answer to the real question you asked. Here's what's gone wrong in education. We spend almost all our time learning how to do step three by hand. Yet this is the step that computers can do fantastically better than any humans. So what we ought to be doing is using computers for step three much more and using students much more for steps one, two, and four. Harder problems, real problems, messy problems, problems they'll actually face in real life. Another way to think about this is what you're doing when you're using math is you're using a problem-solving process to kind of go up this helix, and eventually, when you've gone around it enough times, you reckon you've got an answer that's sufficient to answer your original question. So you've got to learn how to operate this process with modern computing machinery. Here's a very simple example. So this is a typical thing that students might have to learn how to do at school. Solve a linear equation, uh, and um, they would have to do this by hand. But you see, in real life, equations are a little bit harder than that. They come out in more complex actual things. But this is the same basic idea. They were just solving an equation. It's just that my computer can do it for me. Actually, it gets even worse than this, because now I could, let's see if this works, but I will try and get my computer, my, my phone, to solve the equation by talking to it. Solve x cubed plus 2 equals 2y, and y minus x equals 5. And uh, Siri willing, we will hopefully get a result. There we go. And let me try and display this for you. So you'll see there that my phone interpreted that and produced this uh, solution to this equation, and uh, that was courtesy of our Wolfram Alpha technology that, uh, that powers such queries in, uh, in Siri. So, <laughs> the key question you've got to ask is, if I can talk to my phone in 20 seconds and get it to solve an equation like that, why are we spending 10 years of our students' lives trying to get them to solve such an equation? And by the way, most of them wouldn't manage to solve that equation. It's a cubic. So they wouldn't even manage it after 10 years. We should be spending their lives on something more, more useful to them. So we launched this project called computerbasedmath.org. And the basic idea is build a curriculum assuming computers exist. Start from the idea that computers are there, people have them, and they're not going away. Let's figure out what this curriculum should look like. And uh, I won't show you in any great detail here, but uh, just to say we've had early projects in Estonia and Ireland um, uh, and, and other places. And uh, we're making good progress. It's a hard project because you've got to understand what you really need as a human and what you need as a uh, as, uh, get the computer to do. But typical things we're doing is we're starting from a problem. So the problem might be, what's you know, a seven-year-old's problem? What's the perfect password for my login so my friends don't break into my computer? Right? That's a typical problem in real math. So let's get them understanding how you'd figure that out. You know, how do you break passwords? Another one we had for some of the Estonians, uh, am I normal? Good teenage question. Can math help me figure this out? Maybe I'm not normal if I use math to figure it out. Um, the, uh, you know... What's a beautiful shape? That's a relevant question for math. Is fraud occurring? You know, all, many sorts of things. We had another question, are girls better at math? Well, let's take the data and figure it out. What does the question mean? So these are the sorts of things I think math is about. You know, if you look at traditional math, it's about things like, can you invert a matrix? Maybe, but my computer can do it better. So we've tried to link it to problems rather than calculation areas. So here's a typical example that you might find in our materials. Um, this is 
uh, a question where we would divide a class in two, and we told half the class to toss a coin and note down the results, heads or tails, and we told the other half to cheat and to just type it into the computer with their kind of trying what they think would, uh, would simulate that. The question is, if you do some data analysis on it, can you tell who's been cheating and who did the experiment? And the answer, amazingly, is usually yes. So you'll see we ran five tests on the data there, and it failed almost all of them. So that's pretty close to saying I was a fraudster. Uh, I didn't actually do the test. Now let's pretend instead um, I'm going to actually simulate doing the real test. So I'm semi-cheating. I'm going to, let's say, um, do uh, just make 100, 200 random integers. Uh, let me just uh, copy these out and um, the, uh, let me paste these in here. They're, they're ones and zeros rather than t's and h's, but I think it should work. And you'll see that that actually passed all the tests. So that's equivalent to tossing the coins. So this gets into a very interesting discussion. You know, what is it that told us that one was a fake and one was real? And the kids come up with all sorts of interesting ideas. These are real things. This is our you know, basic idea of how credit card fraud detection is done. This is the real math that we're talking about. You can't do this without a computer. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and you know, a typical other module we would have done, I won't go into it here, but how can I convince you? Let's get kids to show data in different ways to see if they can convince their friends of something about the data, even if it's not true. Why do we want them to learn that? Because it will be pulled on them every day of the week. Better to have them understand how to adjust these things so they know what to look for. Now, coding has become fashionable in many countries in education. How does it fit with math? See, I think of math as the process by which you do STEM or life. And I think of coding, in a sense, as the way you express that, the way you would explain to the computer what you wanted to do. So I thought I would very quickly write you a little piece of code. Uh, I guess that's me sitting on the airplane, but there's me live. Um, so as you can see, I'm showing an image. And what I would like to do is um, detect me and block my image out. I thought it was the sort of time in the talk when you'd want to see me blocked out. So let me uh, show myself and let me make some, let's say, do graphics. Uh, what I want to do is put a rectangle over uh, let's say, um, uh, let's say what I want to do is find, find my face in the image and then uh, see if I can uh, put a rectangle over that and see if I can block myself out. And there we go. Uh, so um, in about one line of code with our Wolfram language, I've managed to block my face out uh, and it's detected how to do that. And that's sort of what you want to do with computers. You want to be able to give them a very short amount of instruction to get a very detailed result. I'm going to try this, but this might work or not work, I don't know. I'm going to try and just tweet the result there and see if that comes through. Uh, it maybe, maybe didn't quite work there. That's a, that's a bit of code in testing, in a sense. So what I'm arguing is you need to stand on the power of automation. Once you've got automation in life from machines, you need to use that, and you need the humans to go further. Don't have humans compete with the machines because they'll fail. And that's what I'm arguing. Our turn now to do that is with computation and the future of mathematics. Question, are, is your country, whether that's Bulgaria or elsewhere, is it prepared for what I would call the computational knowledge economy? You know, for years we've had countries try to be in the knowledge economy as opposed to manual labor can the economy be driven by knowledge? Well, the next step of this is, can the economy be driven by the interaction between humans and computation? And that's what I call the computational knowledge economy. Are we ready for that? I think without fundamental reform of our education, we are not. The other thing to think about is, how do you make this happen? Today's assessments in most of education kind of lock the subject, so you can't really move what's happening in education. So governments and others need to think about innovative ways to unstick that ecosystem and reset it so we can have real innovation in education and not just have to stick with the same things until they're proven. You know, I've been avoiding the term math for much of 
what I'm now talking about outside because I think math has become a rather toxic word. I rather like the term computational thinking. But whatever it's called, we've got to reform what we're doing, either by making a new subject or by doing a hostile takeover of the old subject. And it's really vital we do that as quickly as possible. So anyway, um, help us fix math for your country or your organization, and let's uh, unscramble what's been happening around the world to something that really makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.